welcome to It Is My Life Show with Felicity. Today we'll be speaking with a lady who is an intuitive success coach and personality analyst. She's an international speaker, artist and author. Her name is Shirley Wilson. Please welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much Felicity. Today I'm so happy to have you Shirley because yeah. you done such great work considering what has happened to you before. Mm -hmm. You are learned to do your abuse as a child. Please share your story with us. How old were you when this happened? Yeah, so I was 14 years old. I had been attending a church. And in the church, there was, you know, different departments. And amongst one of the departments that, you know, I had been in, there was a leader there who um, groomed me and then it subsequently led to statutory rape. Because I, you know, I had sex with consent, but it was under the premise that this is what you do. I was underage, he was an adult at the time. How do you mean it was consensual? Okay, so, so you, have, you have rape where you know, it's against somebody's will. Mm -hmm. With statutory rape, it was deemed as that because I, I, was, I was okay to sleep with him because he manipulated me for about six to nine months for me to believe that this is what you do, that we were in a relationship, this is what you do as a part of the relationship. So as a 14 year old, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, because we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the day when, you know, I agreed to sleep with him and after it happened, he looked at me and said, if you say anything to anybody, you're in trouble. And then he walked out the door. And from that day to, to recently, I was just completely invisible to him. So How old was he at this time? He, he was over, I don't want to give the exact age because I still want to protect his identity. But he was, he was, def he was an adult in his late teens. So you he finished having his you know, sleeping with you and then walked out of the of the room just like that. Yes. And warned you not to tell anyone. Yes, yes. Which means he knew what he was doing. Absolutely. Yeah, he did. How did that make you feel? I mean, at the time that it happened, um, imagine, I'm thinking this is my boyfriend, right? So, at the time when it happened, it's just like, well, I don't, I was confused because I'm like, hold on a second, but you've picked me up from my house, you've dropped me home, you've saved me seats at church, you know, all of these types of things. If you get, if you get um, baptised, we can get married, like you would tell me all of this stuff. And now here we have it, we've slept with each other and immediately after you're putting your clothes on and you're leaving and threatening me at the same time. So for me, it was very, very confusing. And from then, I felt like, one, I had no voice, and two, I felt invisible, you know? Like did, you, did you report this? Did you tell anyone? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't tell anybody because I, I didn't know that it was, it would have been deemed as rape. Like, I'm just, this is, this is something that's happened in our relationship. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to speak to some people in the church, and I got labelled as Jezebel, and, you know, I ended up leaving the church and then I just involved myself in, in a gang and pretty much just involved in criminal activity, you know, like shoplifting and, you know, like petty things like theft and, you know, all of that. I just ended up in, in a gang. <coughs> Did you think it was because of that incident that you felt unworthy or you didn't love yourself to make you start getting involved in gangs or other activities? <coughs> there were a number of things that were happening. The, the main thing was a sense of community because I've gone from having this place of community within the church to like, well, I feel like I need to leave now because I don't belong here because I've been made to feel invisible. And now with this gang, it's like, oh, well, a relative was a part of that. And the street code is you're not going to mess with somebody else's family member. So there was a, 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 an element of safety within the gang for me personally because I'm like oh my cousin's here and you know there's other people who they don't want to do anything to me so it was a level of safety but also it was a place where I could hide you know because that's where like for me not appreciating or that's where self-hate came in like around that time I didn't like my body because I thought my body got me into trouble so it was very easy for me to dress like a boy and act like a boy and just hide myself from the outside world. So how did your parents feel about you being involved in gangs or such um, illegal activities? They didn't really know. 
They you know? know. No, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to school. I would dress for school, but I wouldn't go to school. And I would just be involved in all of that. Like, I think they, they, my dad kind of found out that something was going on when I got arrested. And he had to take me back to the police station after. Um, so I, you know, a relative came and got me out and then I had to go back to check in for something. I forget now, I was about 15 years old. What were and you arrested for? For shoplifting. Yeah, yeah, so I got a ban from Selfridges, like, I don't know, like, <laughs> they put my face up and said, you're no longer allowed to come in here. I mean, I don't think they would recognise me now, but <laughs> I've been in there since, so, yeah. The ban has been lifted. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I'm sure you, 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 you have been forgiven because yes. you did what you did yeah. as a child. You didn't, yes. know, uh, you didn't know any better because yeah. you were trying to run away. You, you mm. wanted a place to feel secure, sure. to belong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like belonging is just so important just for us as individuals anyway. You know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs which, you know, he speaks about the basic needs of, you know, human beings and just, you know, the kind of triangle. And um and one of them is love and belongingness. And if I've at fourteen I felt like, Oh, this was love and this was belonging mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it's taken away in one moment, mm -hmm. it's just like then what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know? So what that did for me is it kind of opened up this this desire to, or I, I learned that sex equaled love. So for me, it was like, well, now there's this void. How do I fill the void? Mm -hmm. Which then, you know, which is quite common for people who have gone through some type of abuse or something quite traumatic like that, is um, they become promiscuous. So that was, you know, for for a short period of my life, that was what my life was about. Mm -hmm. To fill that void, to fill that gap and be, you know, and sometimes we don't even know that it's happening, it's in hindsight. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, okay, so, and now I understand why I was okay with sleeping with this guy. You know, not, not the abuser, but other guys after that. Mm -hmm. Like, why it was okay for me and not have any, you know, self-worth or value. You didn't love yourself, did you? didn't love myself, you know, so it's just, I, I was looking for the love, and it sounds cheesy, you're looking for love in all the wrong places, but literally that's what it was. But it was to fill that void. I don't think it sounds cheesy, mm -hmm. it's just the basic truth and reality yes. that mm -hmm. here you are, a young woman, mm -hmm. who has been abused and you're looking for love out there. How would you describe for your background, your family background, would you say you had enough love in your family? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was looking at pictures today, just before I came, and I, I was looking at pictures with my grandfather, and I was like, oh, such a loved child, you know, by my grandparents, by my parents, you know, by my sister, by my brother, like, I, I wasn't a, you know, neglected child at all, you know, by my aunts, my cousins, so I, it's not like I was void of love in the household. Mm -hmm. Maybe the expression of it might have been not... You know, like love for my dad looked like providing a roof over my head mm -hmm. and food. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, yeah. so as an adult looking back, like yeah, absolutely, I definitely feel. You know what I asked you because people might say if you had a very loving home or background, why would you go out looking for love? You know, yeah, and behaving yeah. in such, um, you know, like a spoiled child or sure, just sure. bringing sure. shame upon your family in yeah. that way. Yeah. But people do not really understand that. Yeah. There's more to that mm -hmm. than just feeling not being from a loving background, a loving yeah. home. Yeah. Like you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. felt yeah. a different kind of love from the home. Yeah, so like, I mean, like my mom and I, like, we're, we're great, do you know what I mean? Like, as when I was younger, we always used to be around each other, like, all the time, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's not, it's not like I was void of love, Yeah. you know? So, so did, did you have any other abusive ex inter experiences after this one at age 14? Um, I wouldn't, not, not abuse in that way, but more like molested, you know, okay. um, so, it, but it, was, it wasn't that, I mean, it's, it's, it's within the same family, but it's just, it, it's, it was a different thing, do you know what I mean? So it was like, um, and when I say family, I mean, you know, you've, you've got rape, you've got molestation, you've mm -hmm. got, you know, people just saying comments and there's different levels to it. So for me, like, yeah, like I've, I've experienced that where 
a relative tried to get me to touch him. I mean, I didn't do it, but like, ha what if I did? Do you know, like, where would that have led to? You know, um, and then there was another scenario where a relative said that, oh, he needs to sleep with me because he needs to be initiated into some school gang. You know, and thank God, like, it, he, he didn't know what he was doing because then I would have, had it have happened, I would have lost my virginity at nine. Mm -hmm. I was nine years old then. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that, thank God. You know, so in terms of sexuality, I've been exposed to that from a very young age. So, yeah. So, would you say these experiences, this is mm -hmm. what actually drove you to the kind of work you do these days? I'd like you to explain mm -hmm. to our audience the kind of work you do these days to support yeah. people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely say that because, look, when you go through something like that, so, so, so basically from 14 to around 22, 23, I, didn't, I just thought that this was a guy who I dated and who had done me wrong and now I'm, um, I'm experiencing the effects of that. Around 23, my godfather, I told my godfather what happened in its entirety and he was the one that educated me mm -hmm. that I was actually raped. Like I didn't know. I didn't know it was statutory rape because you were a minor, he was an adult. This is what it means. So you didn't tell anyone from 14 to 23? There was one person who knew. There was one person who knew. Um, but other than that, that was it. I don't remember, I don't remember going into depth of the story because mm -hmm. I, just, I just didn't do that. So, so when my godfather told me that it was grooming and I started to research grooming and understanding that grooming is where, you know, an, an adult befriends a minor for, you know, um, an adult befriends a minor for the purpose of sexual intercourse or exploitation. I'm like, hold on a second, that's what happened. So then a different set of emotions came up because now I'm like, I'm angry. I'm like, how could you? Like, so you calculated this then. It wasn't just a relationship that went bad, which I thought it was. But now I'm an adult and I'm realizing like, oh, hold on a second. Like, this was all calculated. Like, you manipulated me on purpose. So, um... So that was when I was around 23, and I started to go through my process of healing, which was just beautiful. I mean, I'm not saying it was easy, but it was beautiful just to see the way in which, like, like God came and helped me through this process. Because now it's a different set of emotions, and I'm angry, and I just want to punch his face, because I'm like, how could you do this to me? And just seeing, like, you know, God asked me, he said, like, who do you feel is the victim? And it took a, it, it, it put a spin on it for me because I'm like, okay, I could identify as a victim if I want to and and think about I, I could identify as a victim or I could identify as a, as a survivor. So when the, I was thinking about things, he was saying this man was also a victim too to the devices of the opposition. So he was manipulated or he was whatever, which whatever's going on inside of him where he's broken, where he feels like it's actually okay to do that to mm -hmm. a minor. Mm -hmm. So it kind of started to, I started to engage this place of like compassion for him. Like it was very interesting because nobody talked me through that. It was just between God and I. So here we have it. Um, I've gone through, you know, just the initial, like looking at my darkness, accepting this has happened to me. It doesn't have to have power over me. I can I can turn this around and become a survivor of this thing and be an empowered person mm -hmm. and find my voice. And it was as I was going through this process, I went to a leadership school in the States for five years, being there, that really helped me with counseling and coaching and undoing the things of the past mm -hmm. that were dictating my future. So, so as, I, you know, I left, I left the leadership school and I've come back to the UK and I'm feeling this burning desire in my heart to be able to help people in the way which I was helped back there because 15 years ago, like who I am today, I, hmm. it's night and day. Would you so, say, you, do you help only people who have been through abuse or other people who just need kind of help or counselling that you give? Yeah, counselling isn't something that, that I do. Okay. Um, counselling is 
over here, coaching is over here. Mm -hmm. So it's on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I seem to attract people who have gone through what I've gone through because they feel like I can understand them, mm -hmm. which is understandable. True. Um, so, but I, I have a lot of my clients are CEOs. I'm very much drawn to people who own businesses or who are in influential positions because I say it like this, that you can be high, to be high powered is one thing, but to be high powered and broken could cost you your destiny and the destiny of others mm -hmm. so for me I know the level of influence that's on my life and had I not become whole the brokenness could cost me my destiny the mm -hmm. things that I'm supposed to be doing yeah. and the people that I'm supposed to be helping mm -hmm. so so now you know I I, I coach people um, and, and the, the crux of what I do is raising people's self-awareness mm -hmm. because I believe that when your self-awareness is raised you will understand why you behave the way you do and that's why I'm a personality analyst because I will help people to understand this is how you're wired, mm. this is how you behave, this is how you are just on your own, this is how you are under stress, this is how you are in the public. Awesome. Because I think it's, it's so important for us to know because rape for one person could impact them in this way and somebody else, the exact same scenario yeah. affects them completely yeah. different and it would be because of the way that they're wired. Yeah. Okay. I'm so happy you've been able to move, you know, away from that, or should mm -hmm. I say, healed, and now mm -hmm. been able to support other people, and also yes. use that experience Absolutely. in a positive manner to support yeah. other people. And congratulations! Thank I you. wanted to ask you this. I know you told me lately that you've been able to confront this person who raped yes. you at yeah. 14. Yeah. What was it like for you to be able to do that after so many years? Yeah, it was beautiful. Like it's. It sounds, how do I say this? It sounds crazy almost because it's like, how, is, how would confronting the person that abused you be beautiful to you? But like, for me to have lived 22 years with this scenario impacting my life, the way that I view relationships, my behavior, my thought processes, all of those things. But to be able to have come to that point where I'd forgiven him 10 years ago, so this conversation on um, in December wasn't to forgive him, he was already forgiven by the time I saw him. But, but for, for me, it was, I'm gonna have this conversation to prove to myself that I'm powerful. And that where I was disempowered at 14, like that, that person no longer exists. Like I'm a powerful person and I'm going to have a conversation adult to adult and let you know, hey, I know that what you did to me back then was actually wrong. And I'm going to actually want to, I want to talk you through every single year of my life up until this point from when that happened. What did you tease? What was his response? I'm just like... Curious to know, yeah. what did he yeah. say? He, you know, I, I have to give him props because I didn't, I didn't let him go. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't just going to skate on the surface. No, I had to let you know. At 15, I tried to commit suicide. I wrote a note, oh, you know, I, I took pills. I went, to, I went to bed to die. And I didn't, of course, didn't die. You know, I, I let him know the nitty gritty, you know, leaving school with one grade, ending up being in a gang, being arrested, being kidnapped, alcohol abuse, you know, set, um, I let him know everything that happened. And I felt like it was important because he needed to understand the magnitude of his decision and how many people it actually affects, because it's not just affecting me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm playing up, I'm running away from home, I'm doing all this stuff. It's your affecting parents, my parents, your my siblings, siblings exactly. Your extended you know, families as well. Exactly. Like what What's going on you know so so he sat there and he just listened and he said sorry is not a good enough word he's like to say I'm remorseful is not even a good enough word like he, he didn't know what to say and and I understand that and you know there were times when as the coach in me wanted to rescue him mm -hmm. but I had to literally stop myself and I almost went into an inner healing session with him because I started asking questions so like what do you think was going through your mind this is how I know that the power of forgiveness is so real. 
Because I'm there asking him, so what do you think was going on back then? Like, where was your headspace? You know, what you did is so rare. Not mm. many victims or survivors of abuse actually mm. have the opportunity to sure. confront the abuser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the one to one. The abuser. I'm very, very, I'm very, the very. Abuser. Yeah, I'm very, well, very. Why do you say the abuser? Because when you say my abuser, you're owning that. Ah. I don't know. Like, and, and it's so powerful because that, that was one of the things that actually shifted my mindset. Of course. When I decided to say, do you know what? I'm not a victim. Mm -hmm. I was just victimized sure. by this individual. Mm -hmm. Because when we identify it as a victim, then we'll walk around and have Feeling that victim. That to me, that, yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah. So for me, it was just like, well, no, I confronted the man that abused me, opposed to I confronted my abuser. Sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, so true. Yeah. So I am very happy that you've been able to do that. And can I add a bit? Sorry, sorry. Can I just sure, add a little sure, bit more? Sure. So, so at the end of the conversation, yeah. like after I just pulled myself back from going into this whole inner healing thing, yeah. I asked him. I was like, is it is it okay for me to pray for you? And it was, it was so powerful for me because I'm like, I mean, I'm a strong believer in God and the power of God. And I'm like, this, this has to be like the heart of God for him. And I said to him, I said, look, what God wants for you is to be able to experience love in a dimension that you've never experienced mm -hmm. it before. I said, grace and mercy is here for you today. That's what this is right now. This is forgiveness in action. And God wants to bring you to that place where you can experience everything that you need to, to experience and to, to bring you to a place of wholeness. And, and he just sat there and he was just wowed. And I just began just to speak life into his life. And I just said, no, this, this is who you are. You are a man of integrity. Oh, wow. You know, it was very, very powerful. You know, I'm, I'm really so happy to hear that Thank part you. of the story that you confronting somebody who did this to you yes. and being able to share prayer and yes. forgiveness with him. And I'm sure he too would have experienced a certain change in his life because a mm. lot of abusers do not know what their victims or survivors have been through. Yes. And it was good for him to really hear it from you or yes. from their from the yeah. the person they abused to know what it was like for them or to actually imagine what it would have been like sure. for them to sure. have gone through that. Sure. I'm so happy for you to come and share your story and also update yeah. um, that or give us an update on the story. Yeah. So right now, how can people reach you? Yeah, people can reach me on my website, ShirleyMawson.com. I'm also on every social media platform. Every social media platform. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Periscope, um, if Blab's still about. Um, I'm on all in the same name? All the same name, mm -hmm. nothing different. Um, and LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn as well. One of the things that I love to do now is to help people understand their personality and why they're wired the way that they are mm -hmm. um, and raising their self-awareness. So I do, I do workshops in schools and in, um, as a part of like leadership training in churches and in corporate mm -hmm. to help people to, to understand who they are and bring that wholeness to themselves. And I'm very, very excited because very soon my second book will be available. So they awesome. can catch that online as well. You look very well. You look Thank beautiful. You. you look Thank happier. You. Thank you. I'm happy for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to Thank the show. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. And now it's time for Phyllis to recommend. Based on the story of our guest today, I'm going to recommend two things. Number one, parents, please teach your young children to wipe themselves in the private parts. That will stop either family members or friends or people who look after them to touch them inappropriately because people do touch children inappropriately without the children knowing. Our guest here, she would have experienced abuse at age nine, but I believe from age two is a reasonable age to teach your children how to wipe their private. That way, they wouldn't have any excuse to say, uncle or auntie or nanny, this touched me somewhere, and they won't be able to tell you what has happened, and they could be threatened as well. Also tell them that if anybody should touch them at the private areas, they must tell you. Even if they've been threatened or warned never to share that information, they must tell you regardless of what has happened. So that's one recommendation. 
Second recommendation is that if you have been through abuse at a young age and having shared that story with anyone or told anybody what happened to you, you must not keep that to yourself because you're carrying so much burden, carrying that trauma about, it will affect your life in different ways. You must share with somebody. Tell somebody from the church, somebody call the social services, or call the show if you're not able to share with any of these people. And if we can help you, we do. If not, we can sign you to people, we can support you and help you. That way you don't have to experience this pain all by yourself. I think that's all we have time for today's show. Until next time on It Is My Life Show with Felicity, remember to SLS. That means to subscribe, to like and share our channel. That way you are contributing to any domestic violence. Until next time, live with love.